So my name is, uh, is in grey, so you don't see it. Uh, which is, because the important part is the title. <laughs> no. uh, and uh, I, as, uh, as Miriam said, I'm just, uh, I have been involved since 2004, more or less. When I came back from China, I've worked in China in Latin America for 10 years and China for four years before that. <laughs> so I've been working a bit on s always the same subject, how, how knowledge is uh, adopted by companies, by enterprises, by industries, how is it uh, transferred from one place to another, from, one, from government uh, labs to university to private companies or to public companies. Uh, and what's, what's the role of policy in all that? Um, I've been also, because of that, I've been interested also in the systems of research, how they are organized, how institutions work together. And uh, since 2004, I've been working in the Arab world. I was coordinator of a project which was called Esteem on, on evaluation of the science and technological capabilities in the developing, in the Arab countries. Uh, in the it was called Mediterranean countries, which is the European uh, uh, pass, uh, buzzword for Arab countries, when you don't put uh, Israel and Turkey inside. Uh, before 2012, 13 more or less, uh, the, the standard wording for the partners of the European Union was uh, Mediterranean partner countries. After the neighborhood policy, it became um, neighboring policy. Uh, the change of vocabulary is, not, is a bit symptomatic of the change of relations between Europe and the Arab countries. And that was just before 2011, when happened the, revolu the Arab revolutions in January in Tunisia and in Egypt, 15 days later, uh, and uh, the beginning of the war in Syria. Uh, and uh, probably what's uh, interesting in all this is that contexts matter, first thing to say. So when you talk about transfers of technology, when you talk about basic economic, uh, microeconomic uh, transfers of knowledge, uh, the context matters. But if you go to the international organizations like for example let's take one par hasard like the world bank for example just i topped on it just by pure chance because it was there and the world bank is saying that <coughs> the arab countries should develop a knowledge economy that's the way to get out of uh, problems chronical problems that are uh, known described in the literature and also by common lay persons tell you that because of oil, there's no interest in investing in technology. Because of uh, authoritarian governments, there's nothing happening and nobody moves. And because of um, underinvestment, uh, there is no employment sufficient for all the young people that are working into the... Living and working in the Arab countries. All this has its part of truth and all this is interesting for us because it's the basic questions that you've been, you will be asked if you work in an issue having to do with developing a policy that, happen, that relates to technological development, to development to go, not to technological development. So this question about knowledge economy appeared um, in fact very early, not in the Arab countries, in 1999 in fact, in the first report of the World Bank that was talking about knowledge economy as a concept. It was the 1999 report of the World Bank. You know that the World Bank produces a report every year. I think this year was on social innovation. So you see that the changes are, can be abrupt. Um, and and um, oh yeah, so the just, just before I enter into that, uh, the end product of all these years since 2010 of, of that is this, uh, this book uh, which exists in Arabic when it was one year difference also produced in one year difference. It's not exactly the same book but it's the same message. So in 1999 there was a World Bank report that was talking about the knowledge economy and describing a paradigm which is we are going to develop um, competitive economies based on knowledge. 
The message is competitiveness. And the more knowledge you introduce into the value of products, the more you will be competitive. That was the message. So we all worked on that for the, la the next 10 years, trying to see what are the factors of competitiveness. And among other things, uh, it appeared that uh, one very important aspect does not relate directly to the companies or to the productivity, but to the system in which you work, inside the institutional system in which you work. So I'm going to delve a little bit on this aspect, on the institutional thing. If you are bored, or if you're not interested, or if you don't understand, please ask me. No? Uh, so the report, uh, there was also at the same time a report of the, on knowledge society, which is not exactly the same concept. It comes from Manuel Castells. In, front, in fact, it comes from, from a very old, the first text that talks about that is a text by a manager called uh, Drucker in the United States uh, in the 60s, the late 60s. And this text was the first one really to say that knowledge has value per se. So that you convert knowledge into money. Not only, you don't, you don't only, you don't only add value, just you create value just by, by doing knowledge. Uh, in 1994, Nico Steyr, who is a German uh, philosopher, wrote a book about this knowledge society and what it means. And uh, it apparently, the concepts are very different from what the World Bank was talking about. Uh, they are talking about creating an infrastructure of knowledge, that is, institutions and, and material infrastructure that convey the capacity, the capability to acquire more knowledge, that is, information that feeds practices, not, not an object. It's not uh, something that I can hold in my hands. It's the things that allow me to do the thing that I hold in my hands. Whereas the World Bank report talks about foreign commerce, trading, exports, uh, value of products. So we're talking about that and how much it costs. And it costs nothing. So how do we arrive from a theory that says uh, we need to have uh, knowledge and all that uh, to end up into battling on competitiveness and having producing products that whose uh, unit value is, is less than 10 cents. Um, the issue was very much investigated in Latin America and in Asia um, for, the, for the early, the first 10 years of 2000, 2010, it has been, there has been a sort of avalanche of studies on uh, what should be done in order to promote competitiveness. And we had um, a series of work done uh, later on in the Arab economies trying to understand industrialization and how you could convert an industrialization that was based on natural resources gas and oil mainly, but also phosphates or whatever is natural, uh, natural resources, towards something that is more, uh, more uh, um, uh, based on, on activities that are less related, not more, re less related to natural resources. Uh, in the Arab economies you had uh, in, uh, mainly in, in Maghreb countries uh, or in Egypt, you had uh, the model of an industrialization based on a heavy industrialization, a first chain industry that would feed a second level industry feeding on itself and going to the consumer market. And this is a sort of stages model that very much pervaded all the policies in the 60s until the late 70s. In the, uh, in the Gulf countries, the things were a bit different because you don't, you don't really talk about industrialization, you just have the issue of a fiscal resource, because oil is a fiscal resource for the state, it's nothing else than that. Since you don't produce anything, you just put it outside and then you come back with the dollars. And you don't really, ha need, you don't really need to build upon uh, a, a material basis. The result is Venezuela today. Um, the exceptionality of, of, there was a discourse about the exceptionality of Arab countries, either, either because it was of the oil or because uh, it was industries that were 
um, not really, uh, that didn't really need to be uh, expert industries. They were industries related to the, the internal dynamic of the economy. This, this, this thing was also, uh, there was an in a strange encounter of different strands of discourses on what development was in the Arab countries. So just before the civil war in Algeria, you had a, a very strong confrontation at the level of the power uh, at the, at, in the government, but also in the society. And that's why it ended up in the civil war, about what should be a real Arab development. Where should it be based upon? And uh, there was uh, a, 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 a symptomatic discourse about what the exceptionality was Bernard Lewis, who is uh, an American anthropologist. I don't know if he's anthropologist or philosopher or, or bullshit writer. Anyway, he talks about, he talks about uh, things like uh, uh, Arabs are uh, pervaded by uh, a feel, uh, feeling of fear that's cultivated since their very early age. So they're really incapable of investing correctly and thinking really right because they, there's, so much, there's so much difficulty in, the, in their heads and, and, and with their sexuality and all that. So they really can't take decisions. These people are not really. So uh, there, was, there, was a so there was this kind of very depreciative uh, vision of, of the Arab elite, which was reinforced by, by, by the, poli the foreign policy of the US and Europe on, 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 on the Middle East. Uh, and, and some people, very, very few, like uh, Abdel Malik, uh, Anwar Abdel Malik, who was an Egyptian uh, working in, in Paris, uh, who was very much working on, on this, against this discourse which on didn't only pervade the cultural sphere, it was also an economic, an, an economic uh, concept. So you had this, this idea about uh, this vision of what was called later by, by, by Said, uh, by Edward Said, it was called Orientalism, this, this uh, idealized view of the, of the, of the, of the East, and then uh, how, how does that translate into actual policies? Samir Kassir, who wrote a very small book, which I, I, I very much recommend, which is called Consideration sur le malheur arabe, consideration on Arab, Arab, um, malheur, um, disgrace, uh, is a small book he wrote just before he was assassinated by Hezbollah or by Syrians, nobody really knows, uh, that, 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 that was really, that was really posing this idea that this idea of an Arab world that is incapable of doing anything that is exceptional, that is, that does have the right resources but not the right policies, is very recent. It's because of the nationalist policies of the Arab countries of the 70s. And it ends, it be, this, this idea begins at the end of the developmentalist policies which were very much represented by what was Syria in the, in the late 60s or Egypt at that time, and or Algeria for, for that case, just before the, just after the, the independence. Okay, well, I did all this because, I talked about all this because uh, in the early, no, in the uh, early 2000, years 2000, the UN Development Agency produced three reports on Arab human development one was based role uh, was talking about education. The second one on the role of women, and the third one on the absence of freedom in the Arab societies. And these uh, reports, which were uh, headed by uh, an Egyptian called Fergani, predicted there was going to be a revolution. It was produced in 2008 and 2009, the two last ones. And it's the only document that is an official document that really talks about this crisis this fundamental crisis. Right. So, um, and they, one, among, for, 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 the, for the purpose of this, this, uh, this uh, conference, one of the recommendations, I think about the, what was the first one on education, was you should promote more schooling, you should promote better universities, you should promote more technical knowledge, without having really a hierarchy between all these aspects. But you, you, there was this idea that schooling 
uh, formal education, universities do promote a better quality um, and, and thus are an investment into the future. For some reason, the World Bank did not hear this message. For some reason, this message that formal education, a better what we call workforce, or a better human resources, as it's called, does not enter into the things that are taken into account in the models of knowledge economy that are developed by the World Bank. There's one variable there among 34 other, or 35 other, other variables, one only one on that aspect. And this, again, goes back to what's the vision of the society you have and what's the relation between what you produce as an economy and what you are as a society. Among other things, uh, well, um, uh, so there was an exercise in the, in the, in the, yeah, this was, that was the, the sort of, uh, the discourse of the World Bank was, yeah, we, if you have knowledge, you have South Korea that began in the 60s like Mexico, more or less at the same period, they had more or less the same levels if you count GDP, and then you see what happens in the year 2000s, and you see South Korea has this GDP, well, they don't say that 90% of it is Samsung, but anyway, there is, is, is there, and, and, and Mexico is, is only there. Okay. One interesting paper I produced once in, in, a, in an edited volume was about a, a PhD student called uh, Nicola, sorry, I forgot her name. Uh, it was on the industry, on the radio industry. Radio industry in Mexico was very important in the late 60s. It was one of the main hubs of producing radios. And in the 70s, they just lost the, 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 the battle of exports. Interestingly, when Mexico in the late 90s, early 2000s, begins to be the, the engine of growth of all the automobile industry, because that's what happened at that time, except that we say only talk about the companies, not, not of the knowledge base that, was, that existed in Mexico. Nobody really took this in in, in, into account. Like saying that the status of exceptionality, again, is explaining growth. You have an industry just by pure chance. Mexico by pure Oh, yes, 2,000 kilometers of frontier with the US explains it all. Well, no, it doesn't. It doesn't, otherwise, the companies that were strong in the late 60s should have been strong in the late 2000, with the same exchanges and interactions, strong interactions with the American, uh, North American market. In fact, you need to have something more than just proximity to investment or proximity to a big market. A good proof of that is China, for example. Okay, so around the years 2005, 6, something like that, there is a knowledge assessment methodology developed by the World Bank saying that uh, you should measure performance with uh, economic incentives, education and human resources, which was what I was just saying before, innovation systems, how they are organized, and informational infrastructure. And trying to convey that discourse into indicators is a complicated issue. So I don't blame them entirely that I didn't make it, because it's complicated. It's complicated, and part of my argument in the book I have with Sari Hanafi is, is that you don't do indicators simply just by because you want to make an indicator and you just collect data. You do indicators because someone asks you something and creates the infrastructure that produces the data that you can use to do the indicators. You are prisoner of the institutional system that are, is asking you a question. When, when, when an institution tells you, how do I develop this industry? If you have no information, no institution uh, around this, this industry, you will get no information at all. So you can create it as a startup. You can, you can create parts, bits and parts, but you will not be able to construct an indicator if you don't have the institutional system that promotes that particular industry. Okay. So uh, they, they produced these knowledge indexes that are now routinely used, well, not exactly on this form, 
in various rankings that you know all, the competitiveness uh, ranking of, uh, of the World Economic Forum, you probably have heard about that more than me. Uh, there, there is also the, the Global Innovation Index that's uh, more recent and probably more robust than the one of the World Competitiveness uh, Forum because it's really more focused on aspects that have to do with uh, industry. I have a funny story about these rankings. Morocco was, I, th I don't remember exactly, in position 140, something like that, on the Global Innovation Index. And they spent two years with the persons working in, at NCAD, which is the School of uh, Economic um, um, in Fontainebleau, and they worked with a group that was appointed by the Minister of Economy to work uh, and to provide some some data on, on one of the issues that was interesting, the Global Innovation Index. And the two years after, um, Morocco had at least 10 positions better in the ranking. So, okay, they maybe had better indicators, but I don't believe into the neutrality of indicators. And I don't think you should take them on face value either. This idea that is promoted by really the knowledge economy. Knowledge economy, basically, it's an, an economy of, of competitiveness and of rankings, of positions. So, so, so these indicators are part of the, of the issue. Uh, where am I? So there was many arguments. Why do the Middle East and North African countries need a knowledge economy? So you have the demographics, too many young people, you don't, don't have, uh, you have a, need to have a working work for the younger people. There is a very strong argument that comes again and again, which is very strange to my eyes, and maybe it's part of the discussion. Isolation. Arab economies are isolated. Okay. The, dis the, the text says, with in, in the report of it, with few exceptions, many countries have by and large remained isolated from the new global economy and must urgently develop more modern economies that are better at meeting the latter's four key success factors of agility, international networking, constant learning and reliability. We have a historian of science in the institute I'm directing, which is called Dominique Pes, who is uh, who has been studying the discourse of the World Bank since 1945 to today by putting all the reports into a machine and he, he looks at the words that are used. And this kind of words, moral words, you know, like reliability and cons being constant and have good institutions and good practices and all that, appears in the late 90s. You, before that, uh, the, the main words were like, uh, you need airports, you need uh, roads, you need boats, you need industry, you need heavy investment. You need okay. So the discourse goes from, from this developmental vision that was very much based on, on, on formal investment towards a sort of vision of, we need quality of interaction, we need more... Uh, uh, good institutions, sort of moral indictment of what you should do. This is what you should do if you want to develop. Isolation is just the, the, the word that was very much used before the Arab revolutions. Before that, they never used it anymore. Uh, so there was a, an many, many other smaller claims, like you need to diversify the economy, you have uh, too many small countries that have a native population that's too much outside the formal institutions. Um, all this is empirically not entirely right and not entirely wrong. Uh, for example, Arab economies do not innovate. End of story. Yeah, really? So, uh, we did innovation surveys in Morocco, in Tunisia, in, in Egypt, in Lebanon. I directed the one in Lebanon and, and, and some others later. There was two in Tunisia. And what the results of these surveys say is very strange and counterintuitive. It says that middle-sized formal industries that are not into the informal economy, middle-sized formal industries, do invest a lot into either producing new products, new products for them, maybe not for the world, but for them. 
very much for markets that they don't really know, so they are not isolated at all, and that try to export a lot. And they are very different from the companies that have foreign capital. So it's not because you have foreign investment, the famous FDI, because usually you have FDI that will save the world. It's so, not like Superman is coming. Yeah, so FDI is going to save the economies. Well, it doesn't really develop the economies because it very much relates to the strategies of the big large companies that are outside the country. So they don't really need any more than the workforce locally. And you can see that in the kind of investment they develop and the kind of innovation that, that's developed. So the argument about uh, industries are not innovative is not really valid empirically. Now, this kind of innovation survey has been dismissed by the World Bank. Because it doesn't fit, of course, the, the, the argument. Um, I'm not going to go into everything, but after the Arab Spring, the World Bank had only one paragraph into its economic report on the Arab, on the Arab economies. It was called Transforming Arab Economies, Traveling the Knowledge and Innovation Road. Because what had, ha had happened? Two years before, they had a big, big, big meeting in Tunis. And this big, big, big meeting, <laughs> it was a lot of government officials from all the Arab countries, invited by Ben Ali, who was uh, so happy to have all these people together. And the World Bank explained that Finland was the good model to follow. And that was the model. And Tunisia was sort of Finland of the Arab countries. You can laugh. It's a risk. And, and the point is that they were saying that very, very seriously. Then 2011 comes, Ben Ali disappears. Uh, you have the mess that happened in the two next years. People really asking for a real change. And the only thing that comes to mind to the World Bank is to say that, well, we need to need to build some new coalitions for change. We should think about it. Uh, Jean-Louis Refers, who was the economist in charge of this World Bank program, whose who's dean of economics was in Marseille, uh, in December 2007 had a surge of sudden frankness saying, I think that us economists, if we don't, um, if we don't see uh, confront our approaches with the situation, and if we don't propose credible evolutions with related to the popular aspiration, then we should just count points, just look at what happens, without having anything to, to, to wait for, uh, and just believe one day they will converge all to being better and efficient economies. And he goes on saying, yeah, well, democracy was not really into the, into the picture, uh, sorry. When we were in our rooms in Tunis, we were very surprised to see, we were not very surprised to see the photo of the president every day in the newspaper and uh, see whatever ambassador was uh, giving him a good hand there. And we had the same impression in Egypt or in Syria. And some of us were saying that was the price to be paid if you won uh, peace, social peace. Uh, and if you don't want, uh, finally, if you want to have a population that is very little sensible to democracy. We were uh, critics, maybe, but not so much. Uh, it was a little bit like, well, shut up about democracy, just invest, that's all. And of course, uh, the worst thing is that he goes on saying, basically what we produced was useless economics advice. And, and then we were doing models and econometrics that are like uh, thinking like we are medics or, or climatologists. Jeffrey Sachs has a whole discourse about uh, economics is like a, a doctor's, the doctor's uh, um, advice. You know, you go to the doctor and oh, oh, I have a sore throat, can you give me a medicine? So Jeffrey Sachs comes and he gives, he gives the advice. And this is a very strong vision that has been conveyed by the role of, of the international organizations concerning the Arab economies. Uh, and, and, and saying that basically the role of economic advice is a role of the same kind of role as the one of a doctor. 
and an irrelevant science. Why is it really relevant? Because the only thing that counts for an economist or an academic whatsoever is to produce papers in the high level ranking journals and end of story. If it's relevant or not, we don't care. What it has to be is to be published. That's, that's what counts. As a, as, a, as a frank I mean, advice, it's quite, it's quite difficult. I, I will not go into, 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 the, into the rankings and all that, but one interesting thing is that when we were looking at the relation within GDP and R&D, there is absolutely no relation. Basically, rich countries or heavy investment in GDP was, was two, two variables that completely independent which completely contradicts the idea that the more you invest into the GDP, the more GDP you produce, let's say, value added you produce, the more you, sh you invest finally into, um, into research and development activities. So the issue is how do you transform the money you have, because these this economies are not really poor. They underinvest in everything, but they're not really poor. There's a lot of money circulating. And there's more people from Arab countries working in the US in the science and technological um, professions than there are engineers or science and technological professions inside their own countries. Uh, you have more Saudis in the US working as engineers, doctors, professors, academics than you have engineers in Saudi Arabia uh, from uh, working in the same kind of professions. And it's practically true of all the Gulf countries and it's also partly true of the Maghreb countries. And the comparison is not with the US but with France of course. Um, so the argument we tried to develop in the book is that there is a relation between institution. How much time do you have? 15 minutes? Okay. The argument we tried to develop is that the relation between the connection between uh, the, the, the amount of um, money that you invest and the activities that you produce, the knowledge that you produce is mediated by the institutions um, and part of the difficulty is that the institutional system in all these countries is um, well it's not really very different we try to do a sort of typology of uh, how n what's the way you could uh, imagine the policy framework and the size with the indicators that we have, the size of the activities counted like uh, um, scientific population, um, investment produced, uh, flexibility of the of the relation between institution, government institution, private institution, decentralization of the knowledge of the of the of the command line, and all these kind of things. So we produce this kind of beautiful schemes there, uh, and showing that you have sort of Common, common way of organizing things for larger countries like Morocco, Saudi Arabia, Algeria and Egypt. We're just talking of small economies, but not small countries. Uh, you have three quite dynamic and, and rather decentralized, with the exception of Tunisia in fact, rather decentralized uh, organizations. Tunisia in fact is very centralized because everything depends on the government but everybody does whatever he wants so it's really it's it's really fantastic a uh, fantastic case of contradiction between what have the formal thing and the and the and the informal thing and then you have the the Gulf countries and then in this package you have uh, the war Syria Yemen <laughs> and and Iraq Libya and in the middle there you have very small economies. Well, like Oman and Kuwait, curiously enough, have had an intense investment into, into universities and academic because they are hubs for international, uh, for international companies in the region. Not only Europeans or Americans, also from a lot of from India and from, from Asia. So the idea 
behind that was to try to understand how you arrive to this kind of organization. Said you one one thing you have to look is history, how the how institutions cr were created a long a long time. Uh, you see also that uh, there was a very heavy investment at some period of time just after the Second World War into agricultural research and health. Uh, the Arab countries, all of them with the exception of Lebanon and, and Tunisia, have a sort of very specific profile of, of, of science. They invest a lot on engineering sciences, physical sciences, chemistry, engineering, physics, and less on health sciences and biomedicine, this, this, this kind of sector. Um, it's also economies where the, the, governor, the people in the government had an engineering degree or, uh, and, and, and the same thing happens in, in, in many of these uh, countries. Uh, there's a very weak role given to universities historically in all these countries, curiously enough, and the importance of knowledge was sort of, sort of a uh, puzzle. If we have bad universities or small universities, how do we tackle the challenge of developing knowledge into the universities? Because if you develop the universities, you have students, and students do demonstrations, and they, and they, they, they can be dangerous. So, I mean, how do you, can, can you have students that shut up? That's a good idea, no? Uh, then, uh, this, this, it's, I'm not, I'm not joking, really, because I, when I was working, doing field work, we had discussions with the ministries of higher education, and that was the discourse they were having. It was not just, it was not just like, uh, sort of, uh, uh, think the, the most important task of the Minister of Higher Education in, in, in Algeria, which is entirely public system of higher education, is how do I feed all these students? Because I have to have dormitories and I have to have a canteen that has enough food for everybody, every day. How do I do that? How much does it cost? And that's really a policy issue, because if you don't feed the students, they do a revolution. <laughs> so where's the knowledge economy there? An argument we have developed, uh, and which is very, very characteristic, before the, before the civil war in Algeria, it was very clear, Ali Elkins, who is one of the best sociologists in that country, he's now retired, has written a, a fantastic article uh, called Hermès et Promete, where he says that there were really two groups into the elite, the Algerian elite. One group that's saying that development should be based on industrialization, and the other one which was saying development should be based on education, and on, on, on Arab-speaking education, on Arab culture that you have should, should know better the principles of Sharia than, than it was better to, to learn about Islamic law than to learn about how to manage a large industrial complex in Anaba. So uh, this, this, this became a real confrontation that was really managed usually by settling the, the battle by giving persons from different parts of the elite to different ministries. So you have the Ministry of the Education, which is usually Islamic uh, promoters of Islamic law and, and uh, traditional schooling in Arabic language, whereas uh, the French-speaking elite engineers and all that were at the Ministry of Industry and the Economy. So of course they ended up doing a civil war. And, and, and the, it was very strong because there was a real challenge in terms of who manages the resource there. What do you really want to do? And there was not room for two different and opposed positions there. One of the reasons why also uh, the, 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 the king in Morocco, for example, had also a dis always a discussion, well, his father and then the new one, Mohammed VI also, uh, had also a discussion with very different parts of the elites. So, Hassan to put all the communists in prison or, or send them in France. 
And Mohammed VI, when they came back, he put them at the Academy of Science. And the, these people, the same people, uh, are all part of the Fez elite of the city of Fez. They're, uh, they're all Farsi people. And they all are uh, very much promoters of schooling for uh, basic secondary schooling and promoting a real m better evolution of their societies with a sort of belief that if you promote education, then you would, the one I believe also, that you would, you would end up promoting the right institutions. I think about, it's, it's good, but uh, I'm, I don't have the proof of anything of that, what I say, no? <laughs> education might not be the clue. Education is probably part of the, of the issue. Another thing that's uh, a difficulty for in all these countries, once I had a comment in, uh, on the book by um, one of the best uh, experts of uh, Islamic law in France, who's uh, this lady, Bernard Mongiron, uh, and she's married with a, with, a, with a civil rights activist in Egypt who is prison every day. Every, uh, he enters into prison every, every month and gets out of it. <coughs> And she says that this strong role of the state into the economies, into the whole organization of the state and the policies, this authoritarian model is finally the only common thing that all these economies have in common. And it's not a, a, a detail. I mean, the, the level of investment that you do relates also to the cost of the activities that you have. In an authoritarian regime, everything costs expensive. Everything is expensive. Water is expensive. Going to the market is expensive. Security is expensive. Everything is expensive. So the, m the same amount of money that you invest does not have the same value. Because you are in a context where you, sh you should provide by yourself against some someone else who has the power or someone who challenges your position into the economy. You always have to overinvest in these activities to protect yourself. And this, 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 difficult, uh, this difficult situation is very common and probably has to do not only with the authoritarian regime, but also with the way uh, the elites relate to, um, to the economy. And not all the elites want to change that. Some things that have changed along, so that, that explains, I didn't bring you the figures there, but that explains why we have less than 0.2% of GDP that is invested in research and development. Why 80% of this amount is, comes from the state and from public organizations, very few investment coming from private companies. And why this is a permanent situation since now more than 50 or 60 years. Probably, uh, uh, and revolution or no, the, th the, thing, the, thing, the thing continues in, in this difficult uh, uh, relation. Now, um, a final word I'd like to say is that uh, the, mm, there was, uh, there's many, things that have been happening into the research system, for example, to change it. Uh, there's been funding by competitive calls which were more transparent, mainly inspired by their relations with foreign funders like the European Union uh, say that, that were saying, okay, we're going to give you, we're going to give you um, or participate into the fundings with you of the research, but then you need to change the way that you distribute the money to the, to the research activities to, into the state, to be more competitive, be more open and all that. There's been a policy that's been very successive, very effective in, in Tunisia of labeling uh, teams. A label of a team is something that's very strange and it's very effective because it's strange because it costs nothing. Um, you have um, a lab that works on immunology, for example, with five or six persons. And it has the capacity to produce some scientific work, 
and to relate to its foreign partners. You ask it to do a plan for four years. In four years, tell me what you are capable to do in four years. After two years, I will evaluate more or less how you have used the budget that you have. And if you continue, I'll, I'll put more money on the same kind of activities that you are doing. That gives you stability into the academic system. You do not exist as an independent entity, but you appear as being a research unit. Being labeled a research unit makes you suddenly more productive. Although you have not really radically changed your activities. Just the effect of having a label that you are a research unit and stabilizing your budget for two to four years uh, has a real impact on the kind of activities they have. In Tunisia, I remember at the beginning of the labeling, between the beginning of the labeling policy at the until the end, which en ended around 2010, they multiplied publications by four, which was absolutely gigantic. There's a, there was also a sort of effort to evaluate the research systems and how they work. And evaluation appeared, uh, in particular in Morocco, as a, as a way to negotiate things between different people into the universities and to the elite. Uh, and this is an interesting aspect of evaluation. When you, th when you read about evaluation, they all talk to you about the efficiency of evaluation, what's the good instruments, the good measurement, the way you should do it and all that. They never tell you that really what happens there is that you negotiate everything. My position to the system, the resources I will dedicate to an activity, the way I want you to see them. And you somehow you impose your way of thinking of what you do, and then you try to negotiate with who gives you the money and the way he sees what you or she sees what you are doing. And this kind this kind of interaction was impossible to do in a system where there was no ever activity of evaluation whatsoever. There was also something that's very important also that happened very uh, we saw in, in the early 2000 in Morocco, for example, was that. Declaring that this is the budget, in the budget of the government, there is a portion of the budget that's called research. There's a chapter saying research. If you see the budget, the state budgets in most countries, there's no item of budget that says it's, this is research. And the simple fact of having this item into the budget, the state budget, has a, a lot of role, a lot of importance. Something else that has a lot of importance is academic careers. These people, all of them are academics that work in universities or public research organizations or public as public civil servants. An important thing for them, that's why the publication and the thing that we publicate and then we publish and then we, we are me measured is important, uh, impacts a lot on their, on their careers. And an, an enormous part of the, of the reason why the academics publish and get known outside their country is because they need that for their own advancement in the, in the, in the career. That seems a very, uh, very mechanical way of thinking. No? They publish, they get uh, promotion, but that's exactly what happens. If you see the committees, the, the scientific committees, uh, into the big university, that's more or less what, what happens. Um, finally, there's something that's changing, and I think it's changing positively, and it's difficult to, to, to evaluate or to measure. There's a there's wider <coughs> connection between the public research investment, and I don't think it's knowledge economy, the public research investment and what are the societal challenges? What are the questions that are raised by society itself? And I think this is something new in the fa in the in uh, because uh, under uh, an authoritarian regime, you're not supposed to talk about what does not what's wrong, no? what does not work, and so on. It's not only that you have to shut up, it's also that these questions are not in the screen. They are not under scrutiny. So you don't invest in something that's not in the screen, that's not under scrutiny. This is changing a lot, in fact, through so civil society organizations, uh, 
mainly. And probably what's really uh, interesting there is that it very much relates also to private initiatives into creating um, companies or ventures that are business ventures which are relatively independent from the state and that are very much promoted by uh, associative civil society uh, organizations. And this is, this is something also which uh, I believe has been happening in the last, uh, in the last five, six years, probably after the revolutions, although it's not always, uh, the outcome is not what is expected, but the, the, there's, a real, there's a real investment into uh, this kind of new, of new activities. And I'll stop there. I have uh, many other things to say, but then we're going to talk about it. So it's not, it's not me that's going to say it. Thank you. So hello once again. Um, I'm Maria Matala. Uh, just a quick presentation. You, of course, you know me all. I'm from Option C and uh, today also my colleague uh, Maria uh, from Option A. We uh, both studied uh, in Turin uh, in the first semester together a uh, little bit about the university and research and uh, uh, development systems. So I think it's a very good application, this topic for us, uh, especially that it concerns um, one of the hot areas of developing countries. Um, right, just with my, <laughs> okay. So we begin our uh, presentation with a quick discussion of the book chapter um, that we were requested to read. Um, and we present for three main points uh, found in the chapter, the data availability, governance, typology, investments and funding. Then we move to a very quick uh, comparison, uh, comparative analysis between two main country groups. Um, we also uh, add some value added to the discussion by uh, focusing on the uh, potentials and challenges of the regional collaboration in the Arab region. Uh, also, I mean, we have potentials in the regional collaboration, but we can also see some challenges through the gender gap. We end by posing some questions uh, that we would like to bring to the discussion. This is a very <laughs> Uh, basic map for and it's actually interesting because we find that officially the Arab region is um, is extending to some parts of uh, Africa like uh, Somalia, Mauritania. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the chapter we have uh, read is um, called the decisive impact of national research and innovation systems, and is found in uh, knowledge production in the Arab world the impossible promise and we would like you to reflect a bit about why it's impossible. <laughs> uh, it's recently published in 2016, uh, authored by Rigas Arvanitis and Sari Hanafi who, who both have worked too much on the Arab region. Um, the major contribution of this uh, chapter is a wide institutional assessment for the national research and innovation systems in the Arab region and the methodology was uh, very mixed with uh, quantitative and qualitative descriptive analysis uh, uh, of, the re um, of the situation. So, um, we can move then to the, the main points as discussed in the chapter. The lack of data, actually this is a wide problem, it's not just um, it's not restricted to the R&D sector in the region, it actually can be found in some, even some basic economic indicators might be missing in big, large, rich countries such as the Gulf countries, but even in some, um, in some other countries uh, we have lots of missing data. This could either be due to the security issues that have been hinted about during the presentation, but also uh, the absence of organizational um, uh, or institutional capacity to gather the data and publish it on a regular basis. There's a very small exception here uh, to Egypt because in 2007 there was an observatory established uh, to, uh, uh, to gather and publish uh, innovation surveys on a regular basis. This has been a bit regular. Um, but at the same time, there are so many questions about um, the reliability of such data. The second point is uh, related to the governance mode of uh, R&D. 
and um, I appreciate this uh, methodology, um, <laughs> this typology, because uh, it has it has made use of a of a large quantity of uh, indicators that might seem not relevant to R and D. Uh, through the principal component factor analysis, and I had to read a bit uh, about how this uh, econometric thing works. And uh, this is how, in the end, when we saw the, the few circles uh, encompassing some, uh, some countries together and drawing some uh, guidelines on how these uh, governance modes are, um, are um, uh, are divided. Anyway, uh, we have seen that there are four major groups based on the large, uh, how large or small the systems are, but also on the, their performance, whether they are dynamic or non-performing uh, systems. Um, we would like also to stress some um, two points actually that came out uh, through the results that the governance central centrality is not a determinant of how the the system performs for example we saw Tunisia which is very central but also we have Lebanon which is very decentralized but at the same time the, their performance are very comparable to each other uh, the second thing is the recent the research agenda which is um, there uh, apparently there seems to be a disconnection between the uh, the research agenda in the country in the countries but also their national needs so the reason behind this disconnection could be the security as we mentioned but also that uh, most of the funds uh, coming from uh, international donors is is proposing other agendas is is uh, actually um, posing its own agenda rather than what's needed in the society. And for this point, uh, Maria will talk to you a bit about hegemonic versus non-hegemonic and so on. Um, investment and funding. Well, overall we have low R&D expenditure in the Arab countries. Uh, we have um, some efforts after, the, after 2011 to increase all of these uh, expenditure. We have in Egypt the case that happened um, a, a constitutional change just to change, uh, just to, to determine a specific uh, percentage of JERD uh, to be 1% by 2016. It's probably missed. The goal has been missed in 2016. But anyway, the, the percentages have been on the rise by time. And um, we have, I, I sp already spoke about the international funding and how it's making a bit of uh, division between the, the research done and uh, the national needs or the, s the national questions. Um, there's also one policy recommendation here, which is to focus on uh, that the national R&D focuses on the more productive sectors in the economy. So it's, it's better to have national R&D rather than imported R&D because we have uh, unreliable uh, foreign R&D and the at the same time uh, by, by switching the R&D more into the productive se uh, sectors this could be this could bring higher value to the uh, to the economy and to the research uh, systems in the comparative analysis <laughs> this is again just very basic um, basic division between um, I would say the North African countries and the Gulf countries. Uh, some countries are a bit highlighted because these are exceptions to their divisions. For example, the first uh, group is large centralized dynamic research systems, but Tunisia is exception because it's a small one. On the other side, we have Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, uh, Bahrain and Kuwait, which are small, flexible and market oriented. However, Saudi Arabia is of course um, um, an, an exception. Uh, Bahrain is an exception because, um, well, one of one of the reason why these countries are here together is uh, the dependence on the um, on the economic on the oil and the economic rents from oil. Uh, Bahrain is not that dependent on oil, of course, and Kuwait already has a comparably well established uh, R and D uh, system. <coughs> Um, well, we s we see we know that the first group is actually um, the first group is um, a middle income uh, group, while the second is high income group, and uh, the first has large populations with large number of research centers, old established university and research ce centers, while 
Uh, the second group are newly emerging countries following uh, religiously the recommendations of the global financial institutions and they are considered as adopters of knowledge economy. However, we would, um, I would like to just read this conclusion drawn from the chapter, which I consider very, I mean, is an excellent conclusion. Uh, the World Bank has indeed designed a knowledge economy index and a set of policy recommendations for the, for the future based on the liberalization of economy, more science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, privatization, and so on. This model has ranked Arab countries in such a way to champion Gulf states as models of Arab knowledge economies. The normative behind this glorification of Gulf countries looks very much as an overestimation of rich and small countries versus middle income countries. So it's basically dividing, I mean, we could just reduce the whole thing to these have money, these don't have money, that's why these are knowledge <laughs> economy uh, champions while these cannot be. Well, this does not actually reflect all the diversity that have been discussed during the presentation among all these countries. Um, in fact, um, again, we, we know that there are um, shortcomings in all the rankings that we have, but we have, uh, even if we look, if we look at uh, the dirt by the, these two groups of countries, we find that they are actually compare, I mean, comparable. We may expect that the second group have much higher dirt, but it's not the case. I mean, even if they are richer, they are not spending in terms of GDP, as a percentage of GDP, much higher than the uh, poorer countries. The other thing is that we, um, we take the Knowledge Arab Index, which is just basically um, com uh, ranking only the Arab countries, so it's not putting them in an in international context, but in a regional context. At the same time, it's more or less following the knowledge, the global knowledge index, with um, doing some exceptions and uh, modifications to the um, uh, to its contents to to take to take into consideration the unavailability of data and all this stuff. If we look at the higher education index, um, whose components are basically inputs and outputs of the education, uh, the higher education, we also don't find much uh, much difference between the two group of countries uh, the same with research and development and innovation which is also the inputs and outputs of uh, the R&D um, yeah I think from here I mean rather than just the seeing the the the, uh, dividing again the region and uh, making further cracks in the in the whole system we we might look at more the the collaboration potentials of the um, in the region because we have problems with uh, international collaboration so what about the regional collaboration do we have potentials for this and for this maria mm -hmm. is going to be talking about mm -hmm. So mainly the book, uh, this book chapter stressed the international and funding uh, collaborations between these Arab countries and Europe, for instance. But we want to stress that um, there is an important uh, and critical role of funding in determining who are and which are the hegemonic research centers in the world and which are the non-hegemonic centers in the world research centers. And mainly all the Arab, Arab countries are non-hegemonic centers and they take, for, um, they take some international research agendas and try to apply within the national context and this is not, this not always reflect the needs and the, social, uh, the economic and social needs of these countries. So we thought, what about uh, thinking uh, inter regional collaboration among these countries and uh, what type of opportunities we, we could find? And the first one is all uh, the same, these countries, they share some common problems. For example, the lack of funding for Egypt and other countries and the possibility of having the Gulf countries as regional donors, but also the lack of national uh, human capital in Gulf and um, the high number of research per population in Egypt and Tunisia and so on. So maybe these complementary needs could be a, f a first point to think about uh, regional scientific collaboration. And there, there is a thought, I don't know if it's um, really relevant, but the 
of McCartoon Foundation. I don't know if I said correctly the name anyway. It's a foundation launched in 2007 to mainly to release uh, data and it works in collaboration with UNESCO to, to build this Knowledge Arab Index. And the main goal is to improve education and enhance the levels of human capital through the region. And we were thinking how could this uh, cooperation could be institutionalized and maybe we have already some sub-regional organizations as the Gulf Country Council and the uh, Arab Maghreb Union. Also, there is been like some there is some literature about the emerging entrepreneur environment in these countries, and a more uh, the, this young generation more interconnected to each other. And finally, this some policies to build science cities, especially in the Gulf countries, and the um, the aim of these countries to be a regional hub. So maybe this could be start point is to thinking about a regional collaboration but at the same time we are talking about middle east countries and north africa countries where the context and history matters a lot so we have a uh, huge security and political issues because it's a region that we still have uh, political and armed groups competing for power in the region so we have a really disturbed equilibrium of power uh, second we have some social challenges uh, as religious persecution, gender gap, and uh, the lack of tolerance in the society. We have uh, some power asymmetry in these relations. For example, the disparity between countries rich in oil and those uh, that are not. And we have, uh, we are talking about sub-regional organizations, but to foster regional collaboration, we should need uh, strong regional institutions, which uh, League of Arab States is not ready to uh, to play this role. Even in the uh, Arab uprising, we didn't see uh, an important role played by the by played by the League. Mm. And we are talking about one of the least uh, integrated regions in the world. Uh, Second point that I want to stress, uh, there is part of the chapter that it says about a national system of innovation and there is a huge literature about how gender diversity could, uh, could lead to more innovative performance. When, when you look to the concept of Arab countries, we see a huge uh, gender gap and um, we should avoid this to avoid waste of talent because we are talking of 50% uh, of the population are women in those countries. And uh, we are talking about positive um, gender diversity with positive effects on the quality of university, public research, and even the quality of patents. Uh, so we need to enhance the human capital value of women in the other countries. And how can we think? How can we do that? How can we build a more inclusive research, educational, and university system in those countries? Uh, just some index comparing like um, the women's participation in the Arab related to other part of the world and um, a thing that I want to stress here is in the past few years we have an increase of uh, women enrollment in universities for example Saudi Arabia uh, in 2007 was 33% and in 2015 grew by 30% so we double anyway but when we go for the labor market, we see that in the same year, the participation of women in labor, it accounts only for 17% in Saudi Arabia. So there is this mismatching between the women enrolled in universe and the participation of uh, women labor force. Uh, to conclude, uh, we would like to raise some questions. The first one is um, relating about the issue of the con control of the state in the economy and the control of the state in the research system. So how the major political events in 2011, and I mean the Arab uprising, that spread all over the Arab world may reflect on the institutional and financial aspects of the re national research system of these countries, especially because after this we had some targets, oh, we would we have to spend 1% of GDP on uh, R&D expenditure and so on. But uh, as we see, this will not be achieved anyway. Uh, how can we think uh, that, uh, how can non-hegemonic countries can create an independent research agenda, given the dependence on international funding? 
given the regional political and economic stability, what kind of policy could be adopted to foster the private in involvement in R&D? Because we saw that many of the um, the private involvement in R&D in those countries are, are through collaboration with universities that may have or not have the support of the state. And uh, when we talk about uh, the innovation system of these countries and this policy of building huge uh, scientist cities and so on, we talk about a, a, a new paradigm that is the network paradigm, that is a more collabor 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 collaborative uh, paradigm with more links and so on. So what are the main implications of moving towards this new paradigm? Uh, essentially for the Gulf countries, when you have uh, states that are not ready to, how can I say, to, to lose control of over the institutions. Thank you very much. And this is our reference. Okay. I think we passed by five minutes our <laughs> limits, but that's okay. Yeah, better. I think uh, the first one is also related to the um, to the economic distress that some countries have faced, especially after 2011. For example, uh, the Egypt is going back again to the IMF and we are seeing too many uh, uh, contractionary fiscal policies. I mean, it's becoming a bit unrealistic to, <laughs> to achieve high uh, dirt again. Uh. Anyway, uh, so we will have uh, you again <laughs> at the table and, uh, and then... Someone uh, knows how to answer this question? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I need some help there. <laughs> um, and then no I think after we will have uh, no many questions for, for, for answering the question. Difficult. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll 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 go back. I'll I'll can I go? I have one more. Come on. Come on. Um, thank you for for the comments. I'm very happy that you stressed things like the gender gap um, and the also the multiplication of science cities, this, this entrepreneurial milieu, which, uh, which is very different from one country to the other. It looks with the same discourse. I mean, everybody wants to promote uh, companies, startups, uh, everywhere. Huh? Uh, I had a student recently, I was in a PhD thesis uh, with a student from Ecuador. And for those who don't know, it's a Latin American country uh, that's uh, up in the hills, more than 4,000 meters high. And there, uh, 4,500 meters in the mountains in the Andes, there is a university called Yachay, which was created. And uh, he called his thesis electric the dream of electric sheep because it was a science city constructed in the middle of a place where there was the pasters with the sheep, you know, go with the animals and you, know, you see the traditional people with their hats and uh, going there and in the middle of all that, which is very agricultural, uh, there's this funny university created there. The buildings are built by Chinese. Um, the whole thing is very bizarre. The, there's a fight also in the government. Korea, who was the government before in, in, in Ecuador, who funded that, in fact, created the first national policy in science and technology. And this is some sort of symptomatic thing that he wanted to have a science city with the fab lab and uh, uh, with people coming, but in the middle of nowhere. Um, so it's all, always very strange. In the Arab countries, curiously enough, um, the more, the more, uh, the more active, um, curiously enough, I say, the more active private sectors is not is usually not involved so much into these fab labs and and startups. It's it, they're usually commercial people, so they do business by by selling things and buying and selling things. And as my father, who was buying and selling things, told me, we don't do nothing; we just sell pure, uh, we just, we don't invent anything. We just take things and put them from one place to the other, that's all. Um, so, um, having, having investment into activities that are related to technology, 
is 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 uh, is always a decision, a voluntary decision. It's not determined by the amount of investment that you have on the first hand. The best uh, incubator, business incubator in the around the Mediterranean Sea is called Beritech. It's in it's in Lebanon in Beirut, in the city of Beirut, and uh, it exists since now practically 10 years. It was created by the University Saint Joseph, which is not really, is, is only an investor into the thing, they don't participate to the, to the activity. They have incubated more than 150 companies. Some of them are, are, are challenging micro Microsoft on specific items, for example, the panoramic uh, photographs that you can take with a machine, with a, it's a, it's a small company, five, ten, now there are 12 people, I think. But at the beginning, there were three, and it's mathematicians, basically. Because that what they were trying to do is to reduce the time you need to, to stick together all the photos that you take with the, with the, with the camera. Uh, the most efficient system today on, 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 a, on an iPhone, on a smartphone, is this small um, uh, company that does it. And I think it has 1,500,000 one, one, one downloads every month. So it's, they have good clients. So the, the, the thing is, uh, Beritech was very efficient because it was totally independent from any public activity. Not because. It was completely independent. And one cannot avoid doing this relation. There was no policy of the state whatsoever. In Lebanon, there's no policy whatsoever concerning innovation or technological development. And the first issue for the companies, uh, when I did the survey in the innovation uh, survey, the first issue was um, we have a problem with insecurity. The fact that you have a war just next in the country next door, 80% uh, of the companies were saying our main problem is this insecurity. What are we going to do? Do we going to lose the business in one week? Uh, what happens? I mean, if, if suddenly there's a break of a security issue, what, what's wrong there? So, um, so this, this was the issue. It was never an issue of, of investment. That brings me back to the, 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 the issue of, so private involvement and having an innovative activity of small companies, small and medium companies, is a solution that society finds to this dilemma between having public authoritarian investment, you do what I tell you, and the FDI coming like Superman, I'm going to save you. It's, it's really, it's a, it's a local solution that makes a lot of sense. And it's not an easy one because, I mean, you have to find your, your market, you have to find the adequate knowledge, you have to find the adequate people. So it's not, it's not easy. Like doing a business is not easy, whatever, whatever the business. So doing it in these conditions is even more difficult. It's not specific to the Arab countries, but in the Arab countries, because of the authoritarian framework, political framework, it became a real way of, 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 of fresh air. Uh, in Jordan, it was very strange because it was the, the brother of the king and the wife of the king who are both sponsoring different science parks, which are uh, developing the activities. All these people, they just want to, they're fed up. I mean, all this thing about uh, uh, you don't have to move a finger, you don't have to say nothing, you can't, you can't express anything. You, I mean, some, at some point, you uh, come on, enough. I'm going to find an activity where I can do whatever I want. And this is probably a solution. Okay. My explanations are not economical at all because there is money. Investments are there. When you do an econometric model, it never works. It always finds zero correlation between variables. So what the hell happens there? You need to have some other explanation. Uh, a, second, a second aspect that is important is we did some five or six years, no, more than that, uh, practically 10 years ago, a sort of meta study on science policies and innovation policies in 52 countries. 
medium-sized countries. And it was, this thing was driven by a South African colleague called Johan Mouton and a French colleague who's now very sick, who's called Roland Vast, who has developed the theory that I, 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 I just mentioned at some point, that a part of the elite makes an alliance with, a, with, the, with the academics, or are the academics, and promote innovation and research, because it's a way of maintaining a power position inside the, the country through the academic system, through the research system, through the university management. Um, when they did this assessment of the 50, I think 52 countries, I don't remember the number exactly, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Arab countries, they tried to find out a common reason that separates countries that invest more into research and countries that invest less. So it was very simple variable, no? More or less, zero, one, uh, or one, zero. And then you try to, 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 to do that. There was no way you could explain by size, geography, culture, history, why they do it or why they don't. But there's something that was very common to all of them. The countries that invested some, at some moment a lot into research, into technological activities, were countries where there was a conscious policy that was designed. You could find a document that was designed pr priorities, institutions that were created to do that, a specific personnel that was trained to do the management of the policy, uh, a, 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 a presence into the international organization saying that we are doing this and that and we are, yeah, we are interested in doing training, in doing exchanges, in promoting collaborations, into investing into research and so on. So it's sort of this voluntary uh, move. I do it because I want to do it. I don't do it because I'm rich or because I'm poor or because I need it. I do it because I want to do it. Because I have an ideal that I want to attain. It's a, I, I imagine that it's better. So I put poor money into that. And I train people. And since I'm going to have the power into the bloody government, then it serves me something. And this something is, it serves my activity as a government promoting research. That's what I want. Instead of maintaining railroads, well, railroads or whatever, I just do, I just do the, the, the research and academic activity. I think this has been, uh, this has been a permanent, the only permanent feature, common feature, that we had to distinguish between one type of countries and the other one. So it seems very, very strange to say that, in fact, to have investment into something that puts a lot of value to your experts, to your... Uh, country as a hub for producing more value depends upon the dream. You know, I have a dream. No? Okay, so, so, so strangely enough, that's the only explanation they could find. And, and it relates, I think, it relates to this idea of the independent research agenda. We have been, when I began working some 35, a little bit more, years ago, uh, I was hired into a research institute that was working in, in former French colonies. Uh, and the idea was, okay, now we have independence in African countries, then how do we develop an agenda that is independent from, uh, from whom, by the way? From the French? But they're here. The, 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 what, what's the point? Um, how do we do that? So, except if you have a civil war, like you have in Côte d'Ivoire, no? In Côte d'Ivoire, in Adiopodoumé, there was, in the north of the city, which was the country where, where the president was born, there was a fantastic research center that was built by the French, and at the moment of independence, the French gave it to the government. The first thing the, the, the Côte d'Ivoire government did was to have fights in that region, so it was destroyed. The whole thing was destroyed entirely. So, the, the argument went then, oh, they want, don't want this thing, they don't care a shit about what we give them, and it's, uh, they're going to think. Well, no, yes, they were interested in different things, not the ones that they had. Um, this, this, and 
and then setting up your own priorities is a complicated <coughs> game. I remind you that until the late 70s, there was this idea, which was very much a socialist idea, that we can have a priority exercise, that we de can determine priorities, rank them, say this is more important, this is less important, feeding people is more important than having rivers, now we say the reverse, usually. Um, uh, so we don't give so much importance to the people dying on the river, but we do a lot of importance to the river itself. Uh, so this, 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 the the priorities were 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 uh, sort of a technocratic exercise. There was the Delphi techniques that were developed for that. There was a lot of planning techniques that were done. There was this idea also that incentives will be put according to these priorities. None of these exercises really were satisfactory because everybody was saying that you, you, it's just you put all the things there and then you don't have the money to invest into all the things that you say that are important. So why, 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 why bother? So after the eight, 80s, late 80s, 90s, the idea was the market will decide. Okay? Since we don't do it technocratically as institutions, the market is going to tell us how we should do it. And then what happens? We, we, we had this um, creation of niches by people who had financial money, financial power, uh, entering into certain areas and saying that these were the important areas that you should invest upon. These people usually do not come either from the country or from the government or from any uh, organization that local. And uh, there's al always a difficulty in, in, trying to, in trying to balance what is offered by external, external funding to promote specific activity and what really you say you need. Um, there's vested interests, one of the issues is that. And, and there is also this, uh, which, okay, this is the most common thing, let's say. And this also this, this idea that the, uh, the priorities of that you have set um, are not backed up by institutions that you know, that, that, are, that you can manage priority that has no relation to institutions that you have will never be uh, will never be uh, embodied into an actual policy um, take an example uh, you want to have um, uh, sufficient proteins for the kids that are in slums okay this is a nice priority i have a lot of slums a lot of kids a lot of poverty a lot of people uh, that, that, that do not, are not in, fed enough. So that's a research topic. Then what do you do there? Uh, you can have um, people telling you that I'm going to do a specific uh, ailment, a specific uh, food uh, that is cheap, easy to produce, and easy, easy to distribute. And then I'm going to have a, a, a program of distribution of this uh, proteins to kids. Okay. Uh, why not? And then there's someone else that comes and tells you, well, maybe what we should do is to promote um, commercial activities into the slums so the people begin trading food instead of trading uh, screens and computers and telephones. The success of one or the other policy will only depend upon the capacity you have to organize the market. It won't depend upon if it's a good or a bad idea. It won't depend upon if you have a lot of money or not a lot of money. If you are able to organize this specific market, then it will, it will work. It might not be the best solution, the one that you adopt. If you are able to implement it, you have it. I have a live example, for example, maternal health in Tanzania 
is entirely in the hands of an NGO created in England to supplement the, 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 the Ministry of Health into maternal health for kids and, and, and mothers, no? the health of prenatal and after, after, after birth of, of kids. And it's, it was important for Tanzania because they had no such policy before and because AIDS was through control of kids and mothers, mainly control through kids and you create an institution, it was a private endeavor under, the, under some control of a, a public activity, it works. Maybe it's not the best thing to do, it works. And it's been 10 years it's working. So somehow you have an institutional creation. And there you have also the connection between the private and the public probably. So I suppose this is one possibility. I'm not saying it's the good, always the good ones, but it's, it's a possibility. Um, In the, last, in the last 10 years, what we have seen in, in many countries, in Europe also, um, the, the, the model behind innovation policy or science policy or research policy has always been a sort of linear, a bullet model. First you have the research, then you have some development, then you have adoption by the market. This is called the linear model. It has been defined in the early 60s by the OECD in a research group that also designed the tools that does, does the s statistics on science and technology called the Frascati Manual because it was designed in a city called Frascati. Uh, and uh, the model of policy making that has been promoted by actively by the OECD and by international organizations is always this linear model. First we develop the research, then we have the technology development, then we have adoption by the people who are in the market or sell or innovation or whatever. Uh, in fact, we know uh, that it's not, it does not correspond to reality. An innovation is always related to, to strands of knowledge, to things, that bits and parts. You have to go back to the research and back to the technology, from the technology to market, to market practice. Then from the market practice, you see things that you can embed into your research. This, this thing about coming and going all the time, between the research base and, and the, and the um, development of the, of the product that you market is, is, is a, permanent, a permanent activity. It's cumulative over, over time. So the more you do it, the more you learn, the more you do things. And it's also very collective. It does not depend on one person's genius. It, it's it's this, this, this permanent exchange uh, that, that makes it valid. Some years ago I wrote some things about learning, uh, technological learning in companies. But this, this is the, the idea, that you have this, Rosenberg had called it, Klein and Rosenberg in a, in a very famous text had called that the interactive chain model. The, the, the idea that you have a chain of activities that follow over time, but then it's interactive between what you do, the, when you do the research, when you do the application. When you go to the market, when you go to the to the research, this, this, this permanent common goal. But then to implement a policy that promotes this common goal and this chain thing and, 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 and that is, is always a complicated issue. So the OECD was also very much promoting for many years this idea that finally became sort of common language to everybody that you need to develop a milieu, a science, uh, 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 um, um, an ecosystem of, of companies, of research centers, of activities that somehow work on the same thing, promote the same thing. <laughs> and, and I suppose that this is probably why uh, you had the development of the, of the science cities and, and of the hubs, business hubs which was the idea was to bring together people from different, different uh, types of activities. The ones doing the research, consultants doing consultancy, um, students, uh, training, uh, market activities, 
trying to bring these things together S and, and so have the whole little world um, stick together you know like uh, going to put them together so you can put them in a desert if they start to treat each other, they in the, and then they go and move away and and whatever uh, there is a problem with this uh, with this vision which is not not bad by itself it's not not and it's by the way it's what it's implemented so that's that's it um, is the fact that uh, it may suddenly work without any uh, outside connection I mean the the network can be completely centered to itself instead of, of, of getting of getting out I don't believe it really works that way because um, you you have th this is something uh, we can have from economic anthropology um, in the late 40s uh, early 50s the one that was promoted by by um, the followers of Carl uh, uh, Polanyi you maybe know this fantastic book called the big transformation the grand I don't know how it's called in English the grand transformation the, big the great transformation la grande transformation uh, the followers of, of Polanyi, uh, like Marshall Salins, like uh, anthropologists like Dalton, were saying that you always have into societies trade and markets. Trade is always something that goes on long distances. Markets is something very local. I think that innovati innovative activities are more or less organized on the same way. You have innovative activities that tend to be long distance activities and they tend to be more basic in terms of content of science because the things that will travel more that are more universal put a lot of okay, universality depends on, on the instruments you have so it but uh, the, so tr the trade of the of the knowledge is a long distance thing the market of knowledge might be all that you need to implement something locally like having schooling like having um, companies local companies like having local investment and finally on the events in, in 2011 if it changed just after the revolution I wrote a paper with Hatem Meini who is an economist from Tunisia with whom I've worked a lot uh, who did the first assessment of science and technology in an innovation system in Tunisia we, we wrote a, a paper called uh, The Resilience of the Research System in Tunisia. Uh, because when you were reading the programs of the parties that went to the first election, there was always a part dedicated to research, science and technology. So we read the documents. No? And basically they were saying just what <laughs> before they were saying before. It, di it, it didn't change really. There's a sort of um, difficulty in thinking of the research activity, of the scientific activity uh, in terms that uh, depend upon the political system. It's like if it was an independent activity of the political system. Uh, it's not because if I, s what I said at the beginning, this, this thing that it's only a voluntary decision. I decide to develop research, I decide to develop higher education and because of this decision I have investment <coughs> into education, higher education then if this is true then the other thing is false it can't be the two okay, Thank you so much uh, that was again very insightful and um, I think we have time for about half an hour for questions. So who would like to pose a question? And um, at the same time, please um, give your names and option before uh, starting your questions. So there's a question reserved yeah, for yeah. Janan for definitely <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and uh, so, OK. So <laughs> Okay, uh, I am Jinan Shuech, uh, I'm option C and I am from Bahrain. Okay, so I have a lot of uh, questions, but <laughs> I will try just to summarize them as much as possible. 
First, I would like to hear about to what extent you classify your grouping. Mm. Uh, first, I have to mention something that is very important. The presentation of today was really um, good and it's moving a step forward from the other discourse. So I am really happy for this joint seminar. It's really um, different than the normal discourse. However, there are problems of in terms of classification of a grouping. For example, if you take into consideration Bahrain, Qatar, and UAE, okay, it's a totally different system. Okay, you have the idea of international branching system, but how it works and the dynamic how it works, the idea of investment, the politics, the social is totally different. Qatar and UAE has something similar in terms of the education model. Bahrain is totally, totally different education system. Even the interaction between the institutions and the people and the government is also different. And the direction of the two models goes differently. So for example, for political and social uh, reasons, in Qatar and UAE, you want, you have a problems in terms of uh, democracy, for example. So you are trying to, uh, to direct the people differently by investing in education, giving massive scholarship, giving massive training, bringing these brand international campuses that is not really mm. meeting the reality. While in Bahrain, they do it the reverse. They weaken the education system because in Bahrain it was really good education system and it has been weakened through the years for political reasons. So the, the idea of the, the dynamic interaction between politics and social is totally different. Uh, second, uh, one of the important issues that Maluk uh, really highlighted very well is that in the Arab region you have a different history, different culture. And this is one of the problems of the research is usually dealing with, trying to put them in, in one package. You, you try at least to classify them differently in your book, but still there is, I, I think there is, it's deeper than this. Uh, I want also to consider some contradiction uh, in terms of these models. For example, Qatar and UAE, you have a, a contradiction in the system itself. The, uh, the system itself that you don't have the people are involved in the workforce. So the, the labor market is depending mainly on the foreign labors. So you want to increase uh, the local in, this, uh, in the labor market and you want to, uh, by Qatarization and giving scholarship and training and all of these factors. But if you go to the system itself, there is a lot of contradiction. You want to localize the, the, the education, and at the same time, you want to attract the foreigners. Mm. And you have a lot of contradiction, and you, because of frontier state model, you are, it's not really working. And why it's not working? And you mentioned this very clearly, but I wanted to highlight it very well in this term. And yes, one more question, sorry. The idea of a small and medium enterprise, uh, you said it's uh, it's a valid way to go out, okay? But I don't think so. Sorry. The idea of a small and med medium enterprise. Yeah. Uh, I think we have to question this idea. Is it really good way to go out of the economic problems that we are facing in the world, not only in the Arab world in general? Mm. I don't think so. I think governments usually put this claim as a way for them to escape their failure from creating many industries and for their, for their failure for the economy. And at the end, thank you so much. It was really, really insightful. Wow. Thank you very much, Professor. My name is uh, Akonde Manwe. I'm from Option A. I'm just curious to know the influence of the rising partnership between the European world and the Arab country on uh, knowledge creation. Because even if you look at Campus France, for example, if I take France as prosy, most of the scholarship in the Ministry of Education now are directed towards the uh, Arab world. I'm even talking s even since maybe the last five years. And uh, I know this fact when I wanted to apply for uh, a FH scholarship last uh, last day and most of the candidates we selected are from the Arab board and I checked the uh, the profile of this FL uh, scholarship and all of that scholarship from France and most of it are going to the Arab board and not only France a lot of uh, European uh, countries are having so I want to know the impact of this partnership with the Arab board on knowledge creation 
Mm. Yeah, thank you. Who else has a question? J rapidly. Can I answer that one quickly? And 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 and, and then you yeah. Because the, the Jinan's uh, question are more complicated. The, 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, the issue with uh, Arab countries in France, with scholarships specifically, is that after the Chinese, the most frequent foreign students in France is from Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia, the three of them, but mainly Morocco. There's more than 50,000 students from Morocco in France. Um, uh, I think even more than that. I think that was a figure of five, six years ago. So it's probably 70 now. Uh, the, and um, the issue there is that um, Campus France is, is very much related to numbers. Uh, it doesn't, it's not, uh, the priorities is, is pure numbers. So you, the number of things they, the number of scholarship they give is related only to, to this demand. Uh, the only exception there is um, uh, Lebanon. There's not so many students, but there's proportionally more scholarship for student, students for, from Lebanon because of French, not for an, another reason. Now, the, this does not really relate to the investment on on scientific collaborations or the science cooperations between Europe and the uh, and the rest of the Arab countries. Uh, you, in science, in the Mediterranean region, including Turkey, Israel, the Arab countries, um, and Europe, the French represent sixty percent of the investment in research. France represents sixty percent. The next second country is uh, is Italy, with uh, with less than than twenty percent investment. So I mean the 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 inequality of, of the volume, the share volume, explains uh, part of it. Hi, uh, my name is Luisa. Uh, I'm from Option A. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I, I'd like to ask uh, more about uh, the national system of innovation of these countries. I'd like to know how, in which way do you think that uh, globalization uh, is threatening or bringing weakness to these national systems of innovation? Um, also, if you could please uh, sp uh, go deeper on the strengths of these systems and what do you think that would be more interesting of building if it's a national or regional uh, system of innovation? Thank you. Any more questions? Um, hello, my name is uh, Afro Zalom and I'm from Group C. So my question is about, uh, uh, I think you just mentioned it a uh, bit, but maybe it will be uh, good if you uh, elaborated a bit about the inequality. Like even the uh, recent uh, report in uh, inequality shows that in especially in Arab world, in uh, Middle East, the inequality is really high. Oh. Even it's like uh, crossing uh, uh, Brazil and uh, South Africa. So how you see this inequality in terms of this knowledge transfer and how you link this, uh, maybe that will be interesting to no for me. Thank you. you can take more questions or we divide. The well, we can take one more maybe or yeah. Okay, I'm uh, Luca also from option A, um, innovation knowledge. And um, my question goes a bit in the direction of the last question of uh, Jenan. Um, you were mentioning in the shortly in the case of Korea that um, Samsung was actually I don't know how much percent of the actual sixty percent something 60 like that. Sixty yeah. percent of the remember, growth in R and D. Very and, high. and also, if we look at the theories on the innovative film, we actually see that also in the um, growth of a lot of countries in history, mm. big firms were actually mm. making mm. Um, mm. big oligo oligopolistic firms made actually a big contribution to the growth of a country and uh, um, investment into um, innovation and R&D. And um, 
my question would be on the one side um, is really like this um, um, national innovation system um, um, direction feasible for those countries mm. and what uh, what role play big firms in uh, in those countries and have they any have the firms themselves um, an innovative agenda mm. for growth for firm growth and therefore mm. also for national growth thank you um, to Can I I'll take the last one since it was also your, your, your issue, but so uh, SMEs as an excuse for their inability, the inability of the governments to support uh, big companies. So we are incapable of doing the business, so we say we should develop the small ones. So we, uh, it's, it's not anymore our business, it's the fault of the others. Huh? Okay. Um, interesting, I've never thought about it. Thank you. <laughs> 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 I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's true. But it's interesting as an argument. Uh, I don't think it's true because uh, the evidence from the s innovation surveys shows that dynamic companies, in terms of investment in research, uh, in innovative products, in uh, new products, is small and medium companies, never large ones. What the large companies do is they buy the small ones at some point. Uh, the, best, the best business you can do is set up a, uh, a, 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 an effective company, make it grow, and when, it, and it, when it's effective suc with success and has its market and all that, sell it to buyer or to, to well, whoever, large company, to ICI, to whatever, whatever to a large company. Uh, so, uh, but this is this is uh, what industrial economists call market dynamics. It's not, it's not related to the innovation activity. So I was talking about the innovation activity. So it's, it's something. Now the inability to create big companies. I don't believe it. Uh, it it maybe was the case in Gulf countries, but all the Maghreb countries created very large companies, all very ineffective. Uh, some of them are still there and exist still there. The, the siderurgical complex of Anaba is the, probably one of the most inefficient companies in the world. It's still there. Sidor uh, in Venezuela is still there. It's inefficient, but it's still there. Um, phosphates of Morocco, it's 12% of phosphates in the world. It's the biggest phosphate company in the world. It's totally inefficient, but it makes the richness of the company. Uh, um, so the thing about big companies, I'm, I'm very, I'm not, I mean, uh, it, it relates to the dynamic of the investment of the company, not, not so much to the policy, uh, um, big versus small. It's, it's not, it's, and it's never been posed in these terms. Um, Industrial, if you see industrial programs in, the, in whichever country, it's usually not a balance between we are going to promote the big ones in that amount and the small ones in that amount. It's like two entirely different policies and usually two different uh, ministries also who are in charge. Um, so so that, that's probably part of, of the answer. It's not the, the whole answer. I agree that it's part of it. Um, What's uh, the very large differences between very small countries? Uh, it's a question of grain of the microscope. Uh, if, you, if you go to s the smaller grain, then you would find all these differences that you were uh, mentioning. And Bahrain's difference with and Kuwait is very different from Qatar and, and nothing to do. It's entirely different histories, different dynamics. Di I agree. Uh, but then, uh, at some point, we were trying to, uh, what we were trying to do was, the first part of this book, the chapter that was mentioned by Miriam um, and Lu uh, Maria Luisa, what's it, uh, is, is, is a chapter that really was a report published by the United Nations that we wrote, uh, where the argument was, if you want to have more investment, you have to 
reestablish the connection between society and, and research and the public policy on research. Uh, if you want, and we had called that the broken circle. The idea was that it's a sort of circle of, uh, circle of investment, feeding, production, production, feeding, investment, and then uh, it was broken. I mean, it was just like a sort of haphazard policies concerning investment, concerning research, and this never connected in, in between. That, that was the argument. Try to reconnect things. Um, so we needed, we needed to have to, so because the argument was uh, we had people from Morocco, they were coming, Rivas, what you say is completely wrong. Uh, you see, we have been doing a lot of things and all that, and, and say, uh, <laughs> What what's the point is there, you have a program of repatriation, for example, of Morocco students and researchers in foreign countries, and you say they were going to create uh, small companies. That's not the reason they come back. They come back because of family issues. They don't come back for companies. So if you want them to reinvest, you have to maintain them in France, where they are, where they have their money, where they have their positions, and try to have them work as foreigners working with your country, not as local, uh, local investors. This kind of, of, of issues. So they were saying, but this is the kind of policies you are promoting is always, um, is always in the detriment of what we do locally to the international. I say, no, what you do need is to connect, the, connect people into, into collaboration, international collaboration. This kind of issues. This, that, that, was, that was the arguments that we had. So we were saying, and they were telling us, we need to have a central government that manages everything. No, no need to have a central government. But then the ones who say, no, we don't need a central government like Jordan or, or, or Lebanon, they were not much better in doing the policies, implementing the policies. So at some point we were saying, you have different structures in terms of organization because of the history, because of the way you organize the state, because of the way you, take po you design policies. But then that does not explain the outcomes of the policies. That was, that was, that was the argument. So yes, you are absolutely right. N nobody is uh, the same. But uh, yes, uh, it doesn't entirely, it's not satisfactory, I know. Uh, something about the national innovation systems. I think I write, this, there must be a sentence there. If you look at the index, there must be a sentence there that says, there's no national innovation systems in the Arab countries. End of story. Uh, why say that? Because for me, the national innovation system, if I go about back to the classics, like Lundwald and the others, is, uh, or, or, or Nelson, I saw Dick Nelson recently, he's really very old. Uh, he's, uh, he's, uh, the, the idea is that you have different kind of institutions, like national policy making institution, institution doing coordination between different, different f sources of resources, different type of companies that interact with them, that interact with the exterior, a lot of intermediate organizations that do this translation of between different demands and, and offers between different kind of needs and, and providing things. This thing uh, articulates different, the different dimensions. I think the best representation of the national system of innovation is not the one that's given by the triple helix um, paradigm, like the government, companies, and, and, um, and, uh, and university and research system. I think the best one is the one that's in the book by Bruno Amable, uh, Rémi Barré, and there's another economist, Robert and Robert Boyer. They wrote a book that's called something like uh, The Innovation Systems in Comparison, Comparison of Innovation Systems, something like that. And they, and they draw, drew a sort of pyramid of institutions, like putting coordination institutions on the top of the pyramid, on the ground, putting the economic system, and in the middle, all the institutions that um, participate into producing knowledge, and somehow either either being companies or being academic institutions, and and it's um, I think it's one of the best representations of this idea that there is a system. 
To have a system, you have to have an input, you have to have an output, and you have to have an interaction. That's a system. If you don't have this interaction, it doesn't work. In the case of the Arab countries, you have elements, and they don't interact. You have the bits and parts. You have the puzzle without connecting. It's like if you had the all the pieces in, you see, a puzzle, but not assembled, something like that. That's, that's a bit the Im image I have. And it relates to difficulties that, that into communicating between different kind of economic actors, different kind of actors from different institutions. Now, there's a lot of informal, one of the things why these societies stick, although they don't interact, is that a lot of the exchanges go through informal linkages that are family linkages, that are, you belong to the same tribe, you belong to the same family, you belong to the same city, you belong to the same village, you belong to the same group inside the government, you belong, and then all this helps you a lot. Uh, an example, the director of the, the dean of the faculty of social sciences of Yarmouk University in, in Jordan is an anthropologist with whom I wrote at least two papers. And uh, one day he was nominated professor, he was very happy. And he told me, that day, I stopped working. <laughs> I said, why? Because my office suddenly became full of people, of all the people that were around, coming from my family. From, he's from the north of, of Jordan. He's one of the largest tribes of the north of Jordan. And suddenly, everybody came to have a job in the university, in his office. So he had to deal with that. No, I can't give jobs to, anybody, to everybody and anybody who's cousin or, or parent or whatever of my family. It's impossible. No? But then you have to deal with that. So it occupies you. So, so you don't do the rest. So from being a very f n good German and French speaking anthropologist, or apart from various dialects and, and Arabic, uh, he just became a guy who manages jobs at the university for all the people around in the region. Uh, this is not exactly a detail, because people of his level of quality of education, of investment in terms of time, you need to create a guy like that. It's enormous. So then you have a guy who's managing the human resources of regionally, that you spend 20 years training as an anthropologist. This, this, and I can give example, a lot of examples of this disconnection that is invisible statistically. Because statistically, he's one more professor in the second or the third largest university of the country uh, that speaks for 10,000 languages. And, and that's very, and, 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 and who's brilliant. But he is not fit to the, for the job he occupies effectively because of his position. Now. Companies that have been efficient in, in, in dealing with, in dealing with uh, knowledge um, content. We had a thesis that stopped, unfortunately, of uh, Rula Atri. Rula stopped because, precisely, she works at the National Council of Science and Technology in Lebanon. She wants to do a thesis on the relationship between the companies and the universities, because we found out that in the survey, they say, no, we have no connection with the universities. Then we go in the companies, and they all have connections with the universities. So what's wrong there? Just they don't do it formally. They don't declare it, either to the university or to their companies, to their own companies, to the ones they have invested in, which is because it's a private relation. It's a personal relation. Me, professor of informatics, give classes at the faculty of, uh, of, of computer sciences at the American University of Beirut. And the people who are in my classroom are the people whom I'm going to employ into my company. And I don't declare it either to AUB or to my company. So there, there are interactions? There's there two. Exactly. There's interaction and innovation system, but nothing visible. There's no innovation system as system. There's, there's the parts, the parts, yeah, the parts of the resource. You write the theory of informal innovation yeah, I should write the theory of the informal innovation <laughs> system. <laughs> and maybe it's not the only one. Yeah. India is the case. India is the case. India, in India, you have a lot of companies 
that are working on the fringes of legality, just because not so they don't pay the taxes, which is a burden. Everybody knows it's a burden. Uh, and then they 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 do rely heavily on people who are trained into the technical universities and the and the middle schooling system, which is a good one, which is known to be a good one. Um, Yeah, about inequality. You asked me about inequality. Uh, it's it's a uh, it does affect enormously the knowledge uh, system. Uh, in fact, what happens in the last years is uh, you have a growing inequality, and on that, or not, I'm, I'm not an expert on that. You have you have heard probably experts on this topic. Um, at the same time, there is more and more. Uh, uh, um, Concerning s research, concerning technology, there's more and more interaction. There's more and more collaborations. Either uh, you measure it through papers, you know, co-authorships of papers into the literature, or f which has co-authorships have grown tremendously in the in the ten last years uh, from different countries. Either you measure it through uh, movements. One of the we did two surveys on collaborations, one between Latin America and Europe and one between uh, Arab countries and Europe. The two surveys were more or less the same size. Interestingly enough, and we used a questionnaire that we had designed some practically 15, 18 years ago, because we did an assessment in the 1998 of the European framework for developing countries. And uh, we had a survey uh, among 1,000 labs that had collaborated between Europeans and, 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 and developing countries. And the great difference between that survey and the surveys we did today, the two ones, the one with Latin America, the other one with Arab countries and Europe, uh, was that today they have more or less, the profile of the person is the same in all, in, in all the countries. They more or less have traveled in the same countries, they have uh, all of them. They have training trainings in foreign countries. They like you, okay? <laughs> like you as a class there. All of you. They all come from different places. They all have uh, long stays in foreign countries, either for studies or after their graduation for research projects. They all collaborate, speak three languages at least, and they all collaborate. Uh, or have participated into research uh, projects that were international research projects. So there's no issue anymore about the difficulty of interaction nationally, internationally. This, this, this is a topic of, of the century before. So today, the issue is you have more of these collaborations, and at the same time, you know that there's more inequality. That brings me to the question, the issue that you brought at the beginning, non-hegemonic. For me, non-hegemonic country in research is something very specific. It's a country that has no capacity to modify the research agenda internationally. So China is not a non-hegemonic, is an hegemonic country, for example. It has changed the agenda, not everywhere, in some, in some areas. It has failed entirely in others. For example, in everything that has to do with biochemistry, in biotechnology, in China has failed every time it entered into these fields. But it has not failed in electronics, in engineering, in, in a lot of other, er, among other things, because they steal the ideas and they develop them much better than the people to whom they steal in. But that's, that's another story. Cisco is the case and Huawei. Huawei is a, is a thief company. It's, it was supported by the, by the army as a private company. Huawei was created by a former colonel of the Chinese army, retired. Uh, he hired 20,000 engineers. That's how he created the company. And he had a market, which was the army. With that, he developed uh, a system in, Xin, in Xinjiang for, to do the telecommunication. He needs servers. 
he took the servers of Cisco, he had a deal with them, and then he stole the, the 3G servers and then the 4G servers from Cisco. Cisco had a process with Huawei for more than 15 years. And one day, they settled the issue because Cisco said, I'm going to anyway, I'm not never going to, do, to, to win the battle, the legal battle, and it makes no sense to win the legal battle when you have a company like Huawei. So we better exchange, I know you stole my servers, Use them, develop them, and then I'll, I'm, I'm going to develop also your servers. So that's much more useful. So they do business together now, Cisco and Huawei. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the point is, they learn that. With that, they develop, they develop the system of uh, telephone system of Thailand and Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was very useful for them because it was a complicated system. Thailand was an easier system. It was a management, a management issue rather than a technical issue. And they just learned how to do things by having a technology that was not proprietary, that was not theirs. They, they copied it entirely and they developed it. When you have this kind of capacity, you don't, you don't really expect to have uh, external uh, interactions. There's, there was not a national system of innovation in China with Huawei. Huawei is an autonomous thing. And Huawei and ZTE work together, by the way, and they're supposedly competitors. But they do the same things with the same clients on the same markets. If you have five minutes exactly, so we can take Clara's question. And that would be the last one. Clara, Clara in the back. You can do it both. We'll, we'll manage both. Come on. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Uh, one of the first concepts you mentioned was uh, kind of a, how they built a certain vision of the Arab world uh, with Orientalism, for example. Um, and so starting from that and then looking at different trends. So you look then at... Um, so my question, like, okay, so it kind of builds like this. So we have a corporate space that is more and more uh, taking in a, a certain definition of uh, the uh, of knowledge um, that is very like based on certain things that are measurable. Uh, knowledge is mm -hmm. a good, and it's uh, mm -hmm. kind of um, washing away certain uh, notions that are embedded into innovation and knowledge, and kind of simplifying it for making it a bit more uh, neoliberal and mm -hmm. and measurable and. Uh, actually creating a kind of a residual uh, strategy. Only, only residual change can be done in this way and no structural things can be done. Um, and then you have university space that is less and less uh, critical space, more like production of a certain type of students. Um, and less and less it's the space where you could actually re-question uh, Orientalism or the Arab representation. And then you have this, uh, the state uh, that becomes uh, weaker and more rent use state. Um, so all of these trends are quite depressing. <laughs> depressing. Um, but I'm wondering, would you s where would you see potential for actually seriously questioning how to build innovation in a way that is uh, considering the critique that you did of what is the uh, current view of the Arab world? And also, um, yeah, is it in, in some of these spaces, is it only the trends that are now negative because we see them as trend, or is there potential in this space now? Uh, is it through social movements that we could have this? Mm. Or where would you see, and I know it's kind of a broad question because you, you are talking about so many different countries, mm -hmm. but through your experience, where do you see this discussion happening? Yeah, thank you. I'm not a devin. I... Um, I think that uh, one of the good things about what's happening today is that the fiction of the Arab world is crumbling. And this is uh, somehow good. Uh, part of it because uh, the rich Arab countries are getting weaker. So uh, they can't spend so much money in having uh, the, the, the immobility, maintaining everybody you know, whenever there's a dispute, you put money, and then nobody disputes. That's, that's the way uh, f I, I lived four years in Venezuela, and I've worked for f more than 15 years with Venezuelan researchers. 
and, and the way you were solving issues in Venezuela was putting money, more money and more money and more. Then suddenly there's no more money. So what the hell you do? So it, you, what can happen is the disaster of what happens today in Venezuela or something else that's probably more uh, it's a difficult change, but is changing these uh, consensual, apparently consensual systems where everybody agrees on everything because it's better not to disagree. Uh, and then, because it's violent when you disagree, that's why. Uh, and then, this system is changing, trying to find a solution to disagreements that is not necessarily killing the guy in front of you. And the, 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 change, of, the change of regime of, uh, of how you manage differences is something very complicated. For, for what concerns uh, research, for what concerns thinking about society, or for example, for that case, the social sciences, which might probably interest you also, I think the confrontation today in the Arab world is with the religious people, not with the governments. Um, um, whichever, uh, m the, the people in the mosques, are sociologists by training, not only because they think about society. They've been to the university. They know what they talk about. And they challenge you when you want to have a discourse in society. They tell you, I also have a discourse, and mine is legitimate, and yours is not. Because I am talking in the name of religion, and not you. So today, the main confrontation is coming to that point. And for s many reasons that have to do with how societies function, I believe that everybody will try to resolve the difference without doing a fight on that, on that aspect particularly. So it's not going to be resolved as it, as it was before, uh, doing wars between groups or communities, but it's going to be a resolution uh, by, by trying to, 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 to find uh, non-confrontations on these on these issues. Why I say that? Because we've been, for example, working on the on the on the um, uh, information about social sciences in in production of social sciences literature, you know, journals, and uh, in in Egypt, in Jordan, in Lebanon, a group of of people. Uh, we have been working and uh, it's been funded by the Arab Council for the Social Sciences and we try to make a portal on social sciences and one of the interesting things was that there was a lot of people coming from religious backgrounds saying no you, you can't do that the knowledge about what society is we know you don't and this kind of, uh, of uh, hegemonic discourse on, on is, is but it's breaking also. It's breaking because you can't maintain things immobile. I mean, this is you, you, you'll have you'll have things to to think. Uh, I mean, then it depends. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I don't know what the future will be. But this is this is one of the things. Um, Sari Hanafi, who uh, unfortunately he came this afternoon in Paris. Otherwise, I would have been with him here. Uh, is uh, telling me that um, an interesting outcome of what happens today in Lebanon, which is uh, suddenly a multiplication of people in the country, there's, there's 4 million and 200,000 persons in, in the country, and suddenly you have 1 million and a half people coming from Iraq, Syria, Jordan, whatever, after, after the war. So how do you manage that? One of the interesting things is that Discussions about the social sciences become interesting. There's a lot of discussion. And it's not any more polarized on the old positions between the communities, or the religious communities, and if the Christians say that, or if the Sunnis say that, or the Shia do that. And, so, and they're joking about that all the time. So uh, even people who are religious. So, so it's, I think, one of the crises of today which is both a financial and a political crisis, is rather a, an opportunity um, for, for, the, for the Arab countries. And, and, and because of the more collaborations, more things that are happening internationally, I think it's, uh, it's, a good, it's a good opportunity, it's a good moment. 
it's probably will be easier in the Arab countries than it is in Africa or in the south of Africa, which is very, very complicated today. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was like really en enlightening. Uh, first, I want to ask you one thing, um, because I belong to that part of um, the developing world that you mentioned, India, Pakistan and stuff. We actually are towards research and education because that's that's what we need. That's the only uh, thing that uh, people in Pakistan or India think like that can turn the uh, you know, the cycle around now, because that's the only thing, that's the only asset we hold. Like, that's a perspective all around the world that Arabs basically, uh, I'll talk about the rich Arab unit, they have, they hold a huge amount of natural resource and which uh, a lot of academics say which will deplete maybe no more than 100 years. And then that will be the point when they will actually move towards this research as a need or education towards as a need. Because we have seen in our part of the world that a lot of labor is moving to these Arab countries mm. for attainment of employment. Mm. And um, when you especially go to their airports and when you visit around, you see a lot of international labor more than Arabs working there. And that's quite like kind of um, a shock because there are people even speaking in Hindi and Urdu instead of speaking any Ara Arabic language if you go to these airports and if you travel around. So I just want to ask you how will this process move on like they have to then change the whole labor market you know they have to take the place of a, um, a w person working of minimum wage and then uh, like a Bangladeshi or a Pakistani working on a minimum wage will be then changed by an Arab working on a minimum wage like is it possible with uh, that authoritarian mentality like do you think it's that easy for me I think it's kind of an impossible thing <laughs> 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 What? Uh, <laughs> you, how much? You give me two, two hours <laughs> to answer. No, no. I just, I ju just one, one point. You probably right on um, on the long term. The the I think the switch is going to be quicker on concerning uh, knowledge investment or investment in education today than it was before because it's part of the things that you exchange. You exchange people who have been trained. The difference, in the countries where you say, for example, in the Gulf countries where they talk all Urdu and, and Hindi and whatever in, in uh, Urdu mainly, in, uh, in, uh, in the Gulf countries is people who are workers. What's the difference today is with what happened, let's say, 20 years ago, is that the Marocchi with whom you find here in France, there are no more workers. They're engineers, they're doctors, they're professors, they're and, and so that makes the difference, the, uh, a real difference. So, so the, the, the investment into training people to be part of the elite that travels and does the connections and, and works internationally is prior to, to, to the invasion uh, into the other countries for working, uh, for working. And so, and I think that will be quicker than, than, it, than it had been uh, in the past century when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, so because I was born in the middle of the last century, remember? <laughs> Thank you, Professor, so much. I mean, I hope not everybody is already exhausted. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. <laughs> Sorry, I talked too much. No, uh, mindfully, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And um, I don't know, we will see each other again yes. soon. <laughs> uh, I have the pleasure to be under uh, his supervision for my thesis. So <laughs> thank you. And thank She's you, everybody. In <laughs> 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 yes, indeed. Um, yeah, and wish you a w happy week and then see you next week. Thank you very thank much you. for. Uh,